Okay, welcome everyone. This is Como Pictons U.S. History 1301 class with Northeast Texas Community College. Um, I'm recording this video for the students who are learning at home. And we are today going to talk about chapter three, colonization and conflict in the South, 1600 to 1750. Okay, so what is going on today is we're going to talk about Spain's North American colonies pretty briefly. We're going to move on to more of English colonies. We're going to talk about the foundation of the Chesapeake colonies. We're going to talk about some of the early crises in colonial history. We'll talk about the Caribbean and the Carolinas. All right, so if you watched the previous video or if you were in class last week, you'll remember that we talked about the founding of Mexico when Spain conquered Mexico and conquered Peru and established their early new Spanish empire. Okay, well, like we talked about before, the Spanish were not just content to have just Mexico and Peru and the Caribbean. The Spanish wanted to continue to expand their empire. Okay, now the Spanish, they send up an early colonial um, attempt into what is now modern day New Mexico in the late 1500s. Okay, so in the late 1590s, you start to see more and more uh, rumors circulating in Mexico about great riches in the north. And New Spain's Viceroy began casting about for a champion of a means to establish a New Mexico. Okay, and so there's this guy named Juan Onate. He moves up to uh, New Mexico with a group, with a group of a couple hundred, no, 500 colonists in 1598, and they manage to start a little bit of a settlement uh, in modern-day New Mexico, close to the uh, Pueblo Indians. And there are some very cautious relationships between these early settlers, okay, the Pueblo Indians don't want to anger the Spanish, so they are very hospitable to them. They give them a place to stay, they let them have one of their villages, and they kind of help them out at first. The Spanish believe that this is a sign that the Indians want them to rule over them, and so the Spanish take advantage of it, and that leads to some conflicts, and Onate's oldest nephew, Juan de Saldivar, was very bold and cruel. Uh, and he started to do some things like a lot of ha things. And, and I'm going to explain this one and kind of use this as a way to explain others. So there's a lot of miscommunication between Europeans and the Native Americans. A lot of times the Native Americans would be friendly to the newcomers at first to kind of feel them out and figure out, okay, what's going on? And then the Europeans would take that as a license to start taking things from them. And there is a lot of racist attitudes in the ideas of the Europeans. The Europeans, they see themselves as vastly superior to the Native Americans because of some technological advantages, because they have a different religion. They think that these Indians need to be civilized and subjugated, and they don't have a lot of respect for their traditions. So anyways, what happens in this particular situation is one of the leaders of the Spanish, you know, colonization expedition starts, starts stealing and killing sacred turkeys that belong to the Indians. And so this makes them upset. There is a, there is a conflict, okay? Some Spaniards get killed. And then in retaliation, the Spaniards come back and they start attacking more. Killed, they killed, they lay siege to the, to the Pueblo, kill perhaps 800 of its people, and it just becomes this big, big mess, okay? Um, at one point, the leader of the Spanish, the Onate or Onate, however you say his name, he like chopped off one let one foot of everyone that was a rebel to advertise how powerful the Spanish were. And anyways, this just really ruined the relationship in New Mexico between the natives and the Spanish colonizers. And they started to just kind of conquer them and control them. Okay. 
at the same time, the Spanish are more interested in Florida. So like New Mexico is something that they the Spaniards kind of want to control, but Florida is much more strategically significant. Okay, Florida is very, uh, very strategically located at the gateway of the Caribbean. To get to Mexico, to get to the Spanish holdings, you have to typically sail pretty close to Florida. And so whoever controls Florida has a lot of control over the Caribbean. And so the Spanish want to control Florida and they get a lot of help from the Franciscans. Franciscans are an order of monks and friars in the Catholic Church that are based off of Francis of Assisi. And some of their beliefs include like, you know, remaining celibate, uh, rejecting riches, and living a, a lifestyle of poverty while ministering to others. And the Franciscans, they actually look to set up lots and lots of missions in Mexico, in Florida. And so when we talk about a mission, you know, you might think of a missionary. These tend to be fortresses or small settlements where the Spanish have missionaries who go out and try to spread their faith to the natives that live nearby. And the Spanish are very, very effective um, missionaries in this way. They see a lot of conversions to Catholicism. Now, were these actually wholehearted, legitimate conversions? Probably some of them, but it's also likely that many Native Americans, you know, were willingly baptized so that, you know, they wouldn't get hurt because, you know, they, there's no way they would know exactly what happened in New Mexico, but they knew that the Spaniards were dangerous and they knew that if they, you know, would get baptized or do certain things, the Spaniards would be nicer to them. That was kind of the idea. And so there is, there starts to be a network of settlements in Florida set up as missions and uh, there's a map of them in your textbook uh, if you look at it. I think, I don't know if the page numbers work the same for y'all, but you can see some sites of Spanish towns and fortresses in, on page 57 and that's where the earliest European city is established in the United States and that's St. Augustine in Florida. All right, now moving on. We're not going to dwell too long on the Spanish, but um, the Spanish over in New Mexico, they set up a second settlement called Santa Fe, which is the second oldest permanent European settlement in the U.S. And Santa Fe becomes uh, kind of, it starts to grow and you start to see more and more conversions of Native Americans to the Catholic faith. These Pueblo Indians, they're becoming subjugated by the Spanish. They're working on their farms, they're going to the missions, and there are a growing number of Spaniards living there. But what happens is that you start to see more and more diseases in these areas, okay? Like the same epidemics that attack the Aztecs and the Incas, they start to hit the Pueblo, okay? Now this, combined with drought, crop failures, and all sorts of other just famines, just like one after another in the mid to late 1600s caused many of the Pueblo Indians to die. And this suffering causes many Pueblos to think that they were being punished by their old gods for becoming Christians. And so many Pueblos turn back to their old religious faith and they revolt against the Spanish. Okay, now this revolt is very bloody. It's very, um, there's a lot of people that get killed. And in fact, this is one of the only successful revolts against European authority in history. Now, last week, we talked about the Roanoke colonists kind of getting run off by the Indians. And that was a successful attack, but that wasn't like a revolt. When we talk about a revolt, we're talking about authority set up and then those that are under authority rising up and throwing them off. Okay, so with Roanoke, it's very likely that the Indians just won the battle and ran off the Europeans. But for the Pueblo, they had been subjugated and they threw off the Spanish rule. And it was successful in 1680. Now, this doesn't last forever. The Spaniards come back and they reassert their authority, but they do it a little bit differently uh, when they come back. But this is one of the only times that we see in, in colonial history 
Indians successfully defeating Europeans, okay? Here's that map. It's really blurry on these printable PowerPoints, but if you can get on your book, uh, you can see the map of those settlements. All right. Now, forget about the Spanish. We're going to talk about the English, okay? Because that's more closely to where we see the United States pop up from. So, the Spaniards, they were dominant in the 1500s. But by the time we get to the 1600s, the English and the French and the Dutch and others are one piece of the pie. The 1500s were dominated by the Spanish and the Portuguese as far as colonialism goes. But they start to wane in power over the course of the 1500s. And partially, some people think of this as partially because of their reliance on gold. And they got all this gold and silver basically for free from the mines in the Americas. And they use it to, you know, buy stuff in Europe, but they don't develop their own, like, economy as a result. You know, if you won millions of dollars in the lottery, you'd have no reason to go get a job. But the British and the French and others, they are wanting that gold and they don't have it. So they are, their economies are becoming a bit more industrial and a bit more productive in order to make stuff that people like the Spaniards would buy. But even though that is developing, most European powers see overseas colonies as the key to a nation's power and prosperity. This comes from an economic philosophy called mercantilism. Today, mercantilism is not very popular. It's not the way we see the world. We see wealth in terms of things other than just how much gold you have. We see wealth in terms of like how productive you are, you know, the size of your economy, that sort of thing. But in mercantilism, the wealth of a nation is measured by the amount of gold sitting in their bank, okay? And the way that a nation becomes wealthy is by having overseas colonies, extracting resources from those overseas colonies and bringing them back to the home country, producing a favorable balance of trade. To, in mercantilism, you want to take in more gold and more goodies than you give out to others, okay? And so, for Britain and France, if they want to be powerful, if they want to be wealthy, then they have to get in on the game, okay? Now, the British and French, for the 1500s, they had to be content mostly with being doing piracy and the little bitty colonies of Roanoke that we talked about in the last video. Now, there's a lot of privateers, people who were basically full-on pirates that would work for the British or would work for the French, and their job was to snipe um, Spanish ships coming back to the Americas full of gold and goodies. And that is part of why Florida was such a big deal to the Spain, the Spanish, because they wanted to control the Caribbean. And there's kind of like a lawless attitude in the Caribbean, and it's kind of wild. But the British are not content just to steal from the Spanish. They want their own colonies and their own source of wealth. And so they had tried to set up a colony called Roanoke, and it had failed twice. And so they're not going to give up. The year is 1607, and there's a new king in charge of England. His name is King James. <gasps> wonder why they called it Jamestown. Uh, you see if you can figure that one out. Anyways, so King James, he is in charge. He's also the king who sponsored the translation of the Bible into English. The, you know, there's other translations of the Bible in English, but the King James Version, one of the most famous ones ever, sponsored by King James. So we're going to see King James' name one more time, I believe, when we talk about the pilgrims in Massachusetts. Anyways, so in 1606, a year before the colony is founded, there are some people in England who want to start a colony, and they create something called a joint stock company. So this group of investors, of merchants, gentlemen, and aristocrats, they incorporate a company called the Virginia Company of London, where the King of England grants the Virginia Company authority to settle a large tract of land. Now, obviously, this land belongs to Native Americans. The, they have no idea who the English are, but the, the King of England has laid claim to this huge swath of land that has been explored by the English, and they tried to settle it with the Roanoke colonies, and the Virginia Company is going to go back and actually start a colony. 
and they land in Virginia in 1607. They want to find gold. Like that's like A plus number one best, best outcome. They're going to find a bunch of gold and become super rich. Their second, second goal, if they can't find gold, is to find things that they can trade back to England from stuff like beaver fur, which was very popular in Europe. There's a lot of fur in North America. It's super popular in Europe. Beaver fur is probably one of the most like desirable because you can make really awesome hats out of it. Okay. Beaver fur, things like pitch and tar, things that products of wood. There's these massive forests in North America that have since been mostly all cut down today. You look at forests in America today, most of them are new forests that have only been grown since probably around the Great Depression when a large part of the agricultural economy ended and they started replanting trees. Um, we should talk about that more next semester, that's the plan. But most of the eastern half of the United States especially had these giant forests that got largely cut down by Europeans who were you know, starting farms. But those forests are wonderful sources of lumber for Europe, okay? And later on, the, Virgin the Virginia Company discovers a crop that is popular among Native Americans called tobacco. This is another part of the Columbian Exchange. Tobacco grows naturally in North America, and people in Europe love the stuff. It's this new cool thing. Everybody's wanting to smoke tobacco. And so there's a huge, huge market for tobacco to be grown in North America and shipped to Europe for sale. They don't figure that out at first. It takes them a little while to figure that out, okay? But eventually they do. So in 1607, they land in Jamestown and things go really badly, okay? The, the Jamestown colony is founded on a peninsula. So a peninsula is land that is surrounded by water on three sides. Peninsulas are great if you are worried about being attacked from the sea or from, you know, the Spanish. And that's what the, the English were afraid of. The English were terrified that the Spanish would figure out about Jamestown, send an army, and destroy them. Now, if you look at a map and you see the distance from Jamestown, Virginia, to the nearest Spanish settlements in Florida, which were these tiny settlements with a few hundred people that could barely keep themselves alive, you know that this was not a real threat, but the English were terrified. And so they built their settlement as a fort. And rather than focus on getting things like food and you know, reliable drinking water and things like that, the English, they land and they get ready for battle with the Spanish, okay? The other problem is that most of these people who come to Jamestown, a lot of these people are from the upper classes in England. These are gentlemen, you know, they're prospectors looking for gold or soldiers and, and working, farming, growing food, things you need to do to survive is beneath the station of life that most of the English that at the colony think they are, okay? And so the first year for Jamestown is terrible, okay? They are surrounded by Native Americans in something called the Powhatan Confederacy, okay? And these Indians who are familiar with the region environment would scatter during the summer to find food, okay? They land, the Jamestown is in a swamp. It's in an estuary. It's marshy. It's not the best place to grow food, okay? You got salt water. It's, uh, you get like brackish water. It's not, that's not where you want to like live, okay? You want to go a little further inland where there's more food, more easily available. But the English colonists, they're like hugging the coast in that peninsula and they suffer, okay? In the first year, only 60 of Jamestown's 500 inhabitants, I'm sorry, not the first year, 1609 to 1610. Just a couple years after it starts, there were 500 inhabitants, all but 60 die in the winter of 1609 to 1610, okay? Now, that was pretty bad. Most of them died. Most of them died of starvation. Um, we're gonna talk just a little bit about the elephant in the room, 
Pocahontas. Okay, she's not even like barely even mentioned in our book. Powhatan's mentioned. You've probably seen the movie Pocahontas. People always ask about this. What's going on? Okay, so the movie Disney movie Pocahontas is very inaccurate. There was a Pocahontas. There was a Jamestown. There was a John Smith. Maybe there was a raccoon. I don't know. I don't know if there was a talking tree. But the details of the story are different, okay? So John Smith was a soldier that went with the Jamestown colony, and the Jamestown colony is just falling apart in the first year they're there. They don't know how to grow food. They don't want to work. They don't want to do nothing. And John Smith is about the only one that has sense, okay? He goes and he explores. He ends up getting captured by the Indians. And there is a story where John Smith is about to get executed, and Pocahontas intervenes to keep him from getting executed. Now, Pocahontas was not the same age as John Smith. John Smith does not, as far as we know, it would be weird, okay, because she's like a little kid and he's like, you know, an old man. There's not like some romance. They don't run around singing together. But that execution is very likely just a ritual that the Native Americans did that John Smith was like unaware of, okay? Because again, there's a lot of miscommunication. First off, there's a lot of just plain old simple, they don't understand the same language. And so a lot of times the early communication between Native Americans and the English is like pointing and signs and like, you know, you know, I'm hungry, have my belly, you know, give me food, that sort of thing. Like they don't, they don't communicate very well. But it's likely that that action was a way of King Powhatan, the leader of the Indians in that area, of making John Smith loyal to him. Okay, so like John Powhatan is saying, I could kill you, but I'm not. So now you need to be my servant or my loyal to me. And so King Powhatan even might have thought that the the European colonists in Jamestown would have been an asset to him later on as, you know, his allies in fights with other Native Americans. And so like he's the head king and then these little Europeans are under him and he is giving them permission to live in an area. John Smith actually spends some time with these Indians and he actually learns a lot of their language. John Smith is like a remarkable character in American history, okay? He was very smart. He was able to figure out ways to communicate with the Indians and he saved Jamestown because when he gets back to Jamestown, things are falling apart. Nobody's wanting to work. There's not enough food. There's not enough anything. And so John Smith just kind of takes over. He starts, you know, slapping people around and says, listen, we're all going to die. I don't care if you are a lord of the court in England or whatever. I don't care how fancy you are. I don't care how much money your dad has. We are about to starve to death. So if you do not work, you do not eat. And he put that law out there. You don't work, you don't eat. And he forced the Jamestown inhabitants to start actually farming and growing food. And he kept them together. He led their you know, forces. He helped the, the colony survive that first year. Jamestown could have easily turned into another Roanoke where they just gave up and left after a year. John Smith kind of held them together for a while. But then John Smith gets into an accident. He was like traveling on a boat and he had like gunpowder and there was a, like an explosion. And um, that explosion then led to him having to go back to England to get like medical treatment and the Europeans are on and the rest of the colonies on their own. Things got really bad. They almost all starved to death. At one point there's serious like cannibalism. Like they dug up dead bodies of people that had died of like dysentery and other things. And you know, just ate them because they were that desperate in the starving time. Um, and the timeline, you need to look up the specific timeline. I think the starving time happens after James John Smith leaves. The book doesn't really mention it, but after the starving time ends, they, they start to 
things stabilize really only whenever you start to see reform, okay? One thing that saves the Jamestown colony is tobacco, okay? They don't find gold, they don't find riches, the only thing they can find that can actually turn a profit is the growth of tobacco. But tobacco has a downside. You can't eat it, okay? So for the people in Jamestown, they had to make a decision. Do we want to grow things like corn and raise cattle so we can survive and eat? Or do we want to grow tobacco so we can make money? And tobacco is a very aggressive crop, okay? So different crops do different things and they require different nutrients from the soil. And tobacco requires a lot of nutrients from the soil and it uses it up quickly. And so it's cheaper for the Europeans to just go acquire more land to grow tobacco than it would to be to get fertilizer and replenish the land that they've already farmed. So this leads the Europeans to be very land hungry and they want more land so they can grow more tobacco so they can make more money. And this leads them to conflicts with Native Americans, okay? And so the easy piece that be, or the, you know, the kind of tenuous piece that John Smith had with Powhatan and the other Indians starts to unravel as Jamestown starts to expand. They survive the first few years of starvation, more and more people come and they want more and more land to grow more tobacco, which leads to more and more conflict with natives, okay? Now, some reforms happen during this time that are very significant, okay? One thing that happens is that the, um, one thing that happens is the Virginia Company basically says by 1618, the colony's been around for 10 years, it's time to end the martial law of like, John Smith type people just coming in and saying, I'm in charge, do what I say, or else you'll all die. So they set up, they set up a form of quasi democracy where there are some representative government being set up in the colony. This is called the House of Burgesses, which is the advisory council to like the governor of the colony. And the House of Burgesses becomes one of the very first legislative assemblies in America, okay? development of the constitution that's might show up on the test okay but one way that they encourage one thing that the europeans realize is they need more people they don't have very many women it's like six to one men to women ratio they don't have enough people producing just food like corn and and cattle and things like that and so what they decide to do is the virginia company technically owns according to the crown all this land and so they give away 50 acres of land for every new settler that comes to America, plus 50 acres for every family member or servant. So if you're a husband and wife and you've got two kids, you can come to America and have 200 acres of land, which is absolutely bonkers to the people living in England. England is this island, okay? There's not land available. Most of the people who own land are aristocrats, gentlemen, who already have hundreds of acres of land and they have their manners and they have their servants. To own land is to be wealthy. Poor people in England don't have land. They are laborers on manors and plantations or they live in cities working in odd jobs here and there. To actually own your own land makes you wealthy in England, okay? To have land is the same as being like, you know, uh, an aristocrat. So the idea that you just go to America and you get hundreds of acres of land for free is incredibly enticing, okay? Thousands and thousands of people start moving to the Americas. It starts off slow, a few hundred every year, but by the end of the 1600s, we have somewhere between 130,000 to 150,000 people from England moving to the Americas to get this land. The problem for many of them though, is they can't afford the passage. To travel to America, you have to get on a boat and you're not gonna get to do that for free, okay? So what they come up with is this system called indentured servitudes. You see, you got 50 extra acres per family member or servant. And so people who had money 
would sponsor people coming to America as an indentured servant. The way it worked was that you would travel to the Americas, you would be someone's servant for a determined, predetermined amount of time, somewhere between, you know, it might be as little as like five, might be seven, somewhere in that area, and you would be someone's servant for that time, working on their farm. At the end of your servitude, you would get your farm of 50 acres of land, and then you'd be free person. For a lot of people, this was great. In fact, three quarters of all immigrants to Virginia were indentured servants. And for many people, this was their chance. They were gonna have to work anyways. Do you wanna stay in England and work for five to seven years on someone else's land? Or do you wanna to go to America and work on for five to seven years on someone's land? If you go to America at the end of the five to seven years, you get your own land. So for many people, this was a no brainer. Now, not all indentured servant to servitude was equal. Some people had nice masters that took care of them. And then whenever they finished their time, they said, hey, thanks for helping me out here. Let me give you some stuff to help you get started. And then some people, they might have had a servant a master who was like, you know what? Um, I'm going to have to charge you for all the food that you ate as my servant over the five to seven years. And you don't have any cash to pay me back. So I figure one more year of being my servant will be enough to cover all the food and, and the rent that you owe me for living in my farm. And things like that would happen. Okay. And indentured servants, you know, sometimes they would face corporal punishment. They would get treated really poorly. And some indentured servants didn't get they got, you know, they kind of got messed over. Sometimes the contracts were written or not followed in ways that really hurt the indentured servants. And typically an indentured servant's not going to get the good land. You know, the wealthy people who were able to afford and come and get these large plantations, they're going to get the nice land and then they're going to give the crappy land to the indentured servants. And typically the indentured servants are further away from the coast which means it's harder for them to get their tobacco to market, which means they're also closer to Native Americans. And the more wealthier are closer to the coast, safer away from Native Americans, easy access to the coast. And so you start to see this stratification of society in the Americas, where some have a lot and some have less. But even then, even if you're an endangered servant and you are you got 50 acres off in the backwoods, you know, bumpkin territory with Indians all around you. You still have 50 acres of land. You are more wealthy than most people in England. Okay. But as more and more people come, they want 50 acres of land. When you have 100,000 people move to the Americas, you're talking 100,000 times 50 acres. Okay. We're talking about millions of acres of land being colonized and turned into farms. And there's already people living there, Native Americans, okay? Tobacco cultivation, again, eats up land. And so they start needing more and more land, fresh land to produce tobacco. And this puts pressure with Native Americans and leads to some conflicts, okay? All right. There is a renewal of wars with Native Americans. Before we get there, though, I want to talk about mortality rates. Because of all this stuff that's going on, there's more and more people. The, the economy does stabilize a little bit. People start growing more food. More women come to the colonies. And the life expectancy, the death rates go down. By the end of the 1600s, by the year 1700, Virginia is a stable society that is very much under the control of Europe. They're not all dying every winter, okay? It was really touch and go at the beginning, but over time, things get better. Anyways, Native Americans try to defeat, uh, try to defeat the Virginians and other groups like Maryland, which gets founded around the same time. Um, they actually have a little bit of success, and uh, the fighting is, leads up to a giant battle in 1644, okay? The Powhatan's warriors kill about killed several hundred English and brought the frontier and brought settlement to a standstill. But Powhatan was captured and he was shot through the head and with his leadership dead, the, his Confederacy like wilted and more and more Europeans come and they kind of push them out of the Chesapeake Bay area, okay? So by the end of 1700, 
the Chesapeake Bay, that area on the coast, you can look at it on a map, that area is very thoroughly under the control of the English, okay? All right, now, Maryland. Maryland actually forms not as a joint stock company, but as a proprietary colony by one very wealthy family, the Calverts. Now, Maryland is founded in 1632, and it was founded largely as kind of a haven for Catholics. The Calverts were Catholics, and like we talked about last week, there's a lot of conflict between the English, between Puritans or Anglicans, the Church of England, Protestants, and Catholics. And at first, there's kind of, it's like whose side's going to win, especially when you look at like Queen Elizabeth versus Queen Mary, who would take over England. There was a chance that the Catholics could have regained control of England. But by the time we have King James, England is very solidly Protestant and is becoming more and more difficult to be Catholic in England. And so the Calvert family has this plan to have this large colony where they are the proprietors. They rule over the colony. People come and work in the colony. They have all sorts of protections from the colony, but they have to give taxes. They called it quintets or quitrants quitrants every year to the government. So the idea is like a business. It's like you can come and live in Maryland. You can use the land and start farms. And all we ask is every year you pay us a quitrant, like a percentage of your profit, okay, like rent. And this is appealing to a lot of people, especially Catholics, because Maryland gives complete religious freedom for all Christians. Now, this means you can't be a Muslim in Maryland, but if you're a Christian, they don't really care what type of Christian you are. Now, you notice the word Maryland has Mary right there in the title. Catholics look at Mary as, you know, a more divine figure, and whereas Protestants look at Mary as a, per, as a person who was blessed by God to bear Jesus, but was not, you know, elevated to a divine status. So anyways, Maryland becomes a haven for Catholics. A lot of people move in. And this is when we have the Indian Wars in Virginia in 1644. That Powhatan, he's kind of smashed between Jamestown and Maryland. And that was his fight ended in 1644. Okay. Now, let's talk about what happens in England. So, In the 1640s, in 1649, England goes through something called the English Civil War. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but for a little while, England got rid of their king. They had a, the, especially the hardcore Puritans, um, they, they were very upset at a guy named King Charles I. King Charles I tried to like gain control of his country away from Parliament. You see, England has a king but they also have a parliament, which is kind of like our Congress. And the parliament and the king are always jockeying for authority. Today, the queen of England is mostly a ceremonial role. She doesn't have that much authority. Parliament is mostly in control. Back during the 1600s, it was very much, they were in competition. Who was going to, who's in charge? Is the king in charge or is parliament in charge? In the English Civil War, Parliament was in charge. They kicked out the king. They took over. This guy named Oliver Cromwell becomes the leader of England, and he basically becomes a dictator. He doesn't let anyone call him a king, but he, like, does all the same things that a king does. But he's not a king. He's Oliver Cromwell, and he becomes a dictator. Anyways, during that time period, in the Americas, it was kind of like just wait and see like okay who's in charge of england are we still english colonies are we loyal to cromwell are we loyal to the king that got deposed who and, and the colonies just kind of stay out of it but eventually the monarchy comes back and it's restored okay and when it's restored in 1660 charles the second the son of charles the first who had his head cut off okay Charles II regains control and he starts asserting the authority of the crown and he asserts the authority of the crown over the colonies in, in America, okay? England is given, and by this time, the Virginia Joint Stock Company has been like taken under the control of 
the colony, uh, or they're rather directly under the control of the crown. And the King of England kind of reasserts himself over the colonies and he passes a series of laws called the Navigation Acts. This very much falls in line with the ideas of mercantilism. The colonies have to support the mainland. They have to send, they have to send all of their trade goods to England and they have to only buy manufactured goods from England, which kind of hurts the Virginia colonists who like to trade with like the Dutch. And at this time, the Dutch have settled in what is today New York or New Amsterdam and other places. There's like some Swedish colonies even running around and lots of people have little colonies in what is today the United States. But because of the Navigation Acts, they're not allowed to trade with them. And this leads to some negative consequences. And by the middle of the 1600s, things are starting to get a little bit rough. Towards the later, later half of the 1600s, there starts to be um, some diminishing opportunities in the Chesapeake. There's less and less of that easy land available. There starts to be higher and higher rates of taxes and indentured servants start getting treated worse and worse. If you are gonna be an indentured servant, you don't wanna go in like the first 10 or so years whenever everyone was starving, you wanted to go in like that second decade or that third decade. That was like the good time to go if you were gonna to go to America because you would have a really good chance of getting like the good land easy. By the, by the 1670s, there's not as much available and a lot of people are starting to abuse the system of indentured servants and extend the terms of servitude and make them worse, okay? And this leads to a crisis called Bacon's Rebellion. Okay. It is not as delicious as the name would hint at. Okay. Nathaniel Bacon is a well-connected guy from England. He comes to Virginia thinking that he is going to basically be all that in a bag of chips, you know, get a nice plantation, move up into the, you know, the governing society of Virginia and be really wealthy. And for many people, America was a place of opportunity for that sort of thing. You might be a nobody in England, but you come to the Americas and it's a fresh start. You get a nice plantation going, you get some, you get some wealth, you get some influence, and then you start becoming, you know, maybe you become a Burgess in the House of Burgesses, and pretty soon you're like a well-connected governing official, has a title or, you know, all sorts of things. You're wealthy, all sorts of opportunities that you would never have gotten back in America, you could have, never gotten back in England, you could have in America. So Bacon decides that that's what he wants to do. Now, the leader of Virginia at this time is a guy named William Berkeley. And William Berkeley does not give Nathaniel Bacon all the things he wants. Nathaniel Bacon comes to Virginia, he's like, I'm going to take over, this is going to be great. And he gets kind of, he gets, he gets basically you know, uh, pushed off to the side. Bacon has to go out to like the fringes of settlement for Virginia, and he sees a lot of attacks from Native Americans happening in Virginia. There's a lot of people in Virginia on that frontier line, the edge of settlement, where there are threats, real threats from Native American attacks to kill you and your family and destroy your plantation, things like that. So Bacon leads armed men to Jamestown. He's, he's really a rabble rouser. He wants to take people's anger and use it as an opportunity to advance socially, okay? He probably actually cared about the Indian attacks, but more, he wanted to be in charge, okay? He wanted to be the leader of Virginia, and this is his chance. He's gonna become a hero, that's his idea. He's gonna go to Virginia, to Jamestown, to the capital basically, and say, listen, we've gotta go take care of these Indians. I'm gonna go do it. So he goes, he leads armed men to Jamestown to protest the ineffective efforts to curtail Indian attacks, okay? But what happens is that he gets, um, he bullies the assembly of the House of Burgesses to approve an expedition to go and kill Indians, okay? Now, he goes off and starts slaughtering Indians on the frontier. Now, Bacon's not the smartest guy in this area, okay? He was pretty good at manipulating the, the Virginians and getting people to follow him. He had some charisma, obviously. He could get people to follow him. But his expedition to go fight the bad Indians, 
turns into a slaughter. He starts killing Native Americans that were allied with the Virginians. And that's one thing that people often forget. It wasn't like all the Indians were against all the Europeans. The Europeans would make out alliances with some Indians and fight with other Indians. And some Indians would see the Europeans as an opportunity to defeat their other in enemy Indians, okay? And so Bacon just starts going and ticking off the people that were friends with Virginia. And so William Berkeley, the leader of Virginia, he basically says, okay, we gotta stop this Bacon guy. And so he starts, he starts rallying his supporters and they declare Bacon as a rebel. He's rebelling against the authority of Virginia. Bacon hears about this and he retaliates. He stops his expedition to kill Indians, turns around, and brings his same forces that were going to go fight Indians, they go back and they fight Jamestown, and they burn it to the ground, okay? A lot of people join Bacon's rebellion, especially indentured servants, okay? The people on the fringes of Virginia, they have been pushed to the margins, they have been abused by the system of indentured servitude, while the people closer to the coast, they were more loyal to uh, Jamestown, and they are typically the more wealthy, well-off plantation owners. They're loyal more to William Berkeley. And so Bacon starts to create this force of, you know, the, the disaffected, the, the indentured servants, kind of the wild, you know, the, the, the out west, the western edge of Jamestown and the Virginia settlement. These people that are off, you know, in the more wild part where things are rougher and they've got a chip on their shoulder. They come back and they attack, and they almost succeed, but then Nathan, Nathaniel Bacon dies from dysentery, okay? And dysentery is a very terrible disease. You essentially go to the bathroom until you die, okay? It's not fun, and that's what happens to Nathaniel Bacon, and when he has dysentery, he can't lead his movement, and it just kind of fizzles out, okay? There is another rebellion in Maryland in 1689, led by John Cood. He leads an army to challenge the proprietary government. What ends up happening is that uh, the, English, the English basically just get rid of, they revoke, they revoke the whole charter that the Calverts had, and England kind of becomes more in control of the colony, all right? But what happens as a result of these rebellions is some things change in America that still affect us to this day, okay? The planters realize that they can't treat indentured servants badly anymore. They realize that if they do this too much, things will be, be ruined. Back in England, they have a long history of peasants being under the control of gentlemen and, you know, the arist aristocrat aristocracy dominating the peasants and the working class. But in America, they don't have the British army right there to back them up. If peasants rise up in England, there's the British military ready to stomp them down. But in the Americas, they can't do that. They're surrounded on all sides by Native Americans who would likely want to see the Europeans be killed, okay? So the European settlers in Virginia, they can't fight against themselves. They have to work together. And so they start to shift from using indentured servants as their force of labor to African slaves, okay? They start to shift to that to gain the loyalty of indentured servants, to get rid of this class of angry English people who are indentured servants and they've been messed over by the indentured servant rules, okay? And this shift changes the life in the Chesapeake and it changes the life in America, okay? In the early days of Virginia, being a slave from Africa and being an indentured servant were kind of hard to distinguish. They both worked very long, hard hours working for someone else who got the reward of their labor. They were both treated very poorly and many times physically punished for things like, you know, not working hard enough. The difference, though, was for African slaves, there was no exit option. For indentured servants, there's this hope that when you finish your term, you will get to be free. But for African Americans, they're slaves for life, okay? Okay. 
and the black population in the Chesapeake remained small throughout most of the 17th century. It was cheaper in most ways to have indentured servants than to buy a slave, okay? An indentured servant, you're giving them land that you got for free as payment for having them, and then you have to just pay their fee to cross over across the ocean. But a slave costed more money, or at least it was a, it was a, it's a different type of purchase. But after 1680, after these big rebellions, when people start to say, you know what, the indentured servant system isn't working out that well. Purchasing a black slave became a better investment. Economically, if you're a plantation owner, you buy a black slave for life, you have them for life. And then you have their children for life. And so this becomes a better idea for many Europeans from white indentured servants. By the end of the 1600s, we start to see, we start to see by like 1698, excuse me, by the end of the 1600s, we see the number of Africans sold by British dealers swelling to 20,000 annually. So we start to see more and more slaves being imported. And this changes the culture of what will eventually become the South in the United States. Okay, so the slave trade, the Atlantic slave trade, is one of the most horrific things that has ever been done in the history of humanity, okay? Literally, millions of people were kidnapped and captured from their homes in Africa, shoved onto boats, crammed tight as they possibly could to the point where it's standing room only in most of these boats, and shipped across the ocean for several months without, with very little food, very little water, just barely enough to survive. Most slave traders just already predicted, like we're gonna, we're gonna lose some slaves on the passage anyway, so we're gonna cram the boat with as many as possible so that we have some to sell when we get to the Americas. It was very, very brutal, okay? Now, slave imports grew as the cultivation of plantation crops like sugar became more and more popular, okay? Lots of Africans are brought to the, what will become the United States, but most Africans who are bought as slaves end up in the Caribbean on sugar plantations, okay? Sugar, like we talked about before in class, very desirable in Europe. It's a very profitable market. The islands in the Caribbean are perfect for growing sugar as far as the climate goes. The only problem is the work is very brutal, very difficult, and it has a very short life expectancy. Okay, between 1700 and 1850, some 9 million Africans are brought to the Americas as slaves. That's North and South America and the Caribbean, okay? Most of them went to places like the Caribbean and Brazil. A small minority actually went to the Americas, which is kind of strange to think about that, but there weren't as many that were brought to the Americas. The difference uh, for, to what would become the United States of America. The difference was the United States of America had a much higher or a much higher survival rate for slaves. If you were a slave and you could pick where you would want to go, which you didn't get to, but it would be better to end up in the Americas just for the fact that you'd probably survive longer than you would in a um, sugar plantation in the Caribbean, which is awful and horrible to think about it, but that's how it was. This changed West African society. Again, the slave capture, the people who would go out and hunt people and capture them as slaves were not Europeans for the most part. They were African societies, African chiefdoms, African kingdoms, African states that were already engaged in the slave trade before Europeans interacted with them. But the Europeans brought so much demand for slaves that it transformed the economy of that place to make it completely run on slave trade. Okay, and so there's a lot of profit from the slave trade. You see, you'll see maps of things called the triangular trade, where you'll see raw materials and resources from the Americas being sent to England and, and, and the Europe and processed and turned into manufactured goods. Things like gold are then brought over to Africa. They use that to buy slaves and those slaves are brought to the Americas to produce the raw materials and resources that then go back to Europe. And this triangular trade led to millions and millions of Africans being brought to the Americas, but it also built up these massive slave trading empires that were very powerful and wealthy in West Africa. Now that middle passage, that middle part of the triangle was a nightmarish journey. They could last anywhere from three weeks to three months. Like we talked about before, crammed, 
nasty conditions, about 15% of those bound for North America would die on the Middle Passage, okay? There are some maps in uh, your textbook and some pictures in your textbook that'll show you like the regions where these slaves would be captured and where they would be traded. And this map kind of shows you again, like where, in, I know it's blurry, but you can see most of the slaves ended up in like Brazil and the Caribbean and a small number actually went to the Americas, but it was a significant amount. Now, the slave trade was very brutal. It was commodifying, you know, humans, turning humans into products and objects, treating a human like you would a farm implement. Okay. There was a period called seasoning was what they would call the period of time when someone who would become a slave their first year or so of being a slave, whether or not they would die. Okay. Now imagine you live in Africa. Okay. You've lived in your tribe. You've lived a certain way your whole life. You're used to this one type of life. You have a different religion. You have a different name. You have a different language. You get kidnapped. You get captured. You get shackled in chains. You get drug out to the coast. You get crammed into a boat and you manage to survive and you're brought to the Americas. Once you get to the Americas, you're sold and you're forced to work immediately. People are yelling at you in English. Okay. You're given a different name. And a lot of slaves died in the first year of being in the Americas. That, similar to Native Americans not being used to the diseases that Europeans had, Africans had a higher rate of, of survivability from malaria. And there's some research into things like sickle cell anemia and like things that Africans had genetically and things that they've been exposed to as children that made them more survivable for malaria. But the but one consequence of that is potentially that they weren't as successful at resisting the diseases of Europe. And so a lot of slaves are killed or die during the first year of their captivity, okay? Now, this, this period uh, would see, let's see, we have mortality rates were high, far higher. One quarter of all Africans died in their first year in the Chesapeake and among Carolina and Caribbean slaves, mortality rates were far higher, okay? Uh, Africans had to adapt to life without freedom in a wholly unfamiliar country and culture, okay? And especially for first-generation slaves, they lived a huge portion of their life as free, and now they're slaves. This is very difficult, okay? And that's an understatement. It's horrendous and awful. The laws start to change in the colonies to reflect the larger and increasing number of Africans in in the Americas. We're gonna talk about the colonies of Carolina in a moment. They start to be outnumbered, okay? The number of white people living in the Carolinas, particularly South Carolina, becomes less than the number of Africans living in South Carolina. And so to keep these slaves in check and to keep them under control of the white masters, they start to change the laws about, about what you can do to a slave and what you can do to a servant. Indentured servants that are white get much more protection under the law than slaves who are treated as property. Uh, the, the decision is made that slavery is inherited through the mother. That's very significant. If you're born to a slave, you are a slave. And that creates this idea that you have generational slavery. But it also means that if a white master rapes his African slave that's a woman and they have kids, he has created more slaves. Okay, and that's a big deal. Things start to change. And what this actually does is it creates unity among poor whites and wealthy whites by creating a second class of people as Africans. Okay, and then again, a lot of this is in response to Bacon's rebellion. In order to keep poor white indentured servants from rebelling against the wealthy plantation owners, the laws give a lot of privileges to white people and oppress black people. And this create, this is the beginning of kind of the Southern, the racism that is very common in the South and still exists even today, okay? This idea that white people have a privileged status in society goes back to the early days of colonization, okay? And this, and, and if you look at it from like an economic standpoint, it doesn't make sense for the white poor landowners or the indentured servants to be friendly with the powerful aristocrats that have huge plantations, 
okay? Why should a poor white farmer, you know, who's all off on his own, you know, try to help out this big massive landowner, you know, in Jamestown who has thousands of acres and hundreds of slaves? Why should they be friends, okay? Some historians argue that the changes with laws with black people privilege those white people and bring them into unity with each other, okay? By 1700, Chesapeake society is much more stable and you start to see the development of this landed gentry, these people that have large plantations, they cultivate and sell tobacco, and they create a lifestyle very similar to that of plantation and manor owners back in England. And there is that sort of same aristocracy and kind of like culture of honor of like, you know, knights and ladies of England kind of being transported into the South, where even today you see the idea of like, so the ideas of Southern hospitality and, you know, like being polite is much more common in the South. Some of that goes back to these Southern plantation owners trying to, you know, replicate the chivalry codes of the knights and nobles and lords and ladies of medieval Europe that they were trying to recreate. They're trying to become their own sort of feudal lords in a weird way. But that, that culture develops in the South and is much different than the culture that is in the Northern part of the United States. But some people see these as the origin points of a lot of the things that make the South Southern in different ways than the North, okay? Now we're gonna move a little bit faster, okay? Uh, the Caribbean gets transformed into like sugar islands all over. The Spanish, their control, by the 1700s, the Spanish are not the top dogs anymore. The British and the French have really started to overtake them. The Dutch start getting involved and start pushing out the Portuguese in many parts of the world. And the paradise of the Caribbean gets turned into sugar plantations, okay? And we start to see lots and lots of slaves being imported in the Caribbean. And these English colonies that get pop up in places like, you know, the Bahamas, Jamaica, things like that. Um, Jamaica eventually becomes under control of England. I don't think it's at first, but, and then the Bahamas later. But the English and, and French colonies and all these colonies that become sugar islands are very, very hypersensitive to the reality of slave revolts. Most of these colonies are built like fortresses and there are lots and lots of slave revolts in the Caribbean, which then leads to very harsh and punitive measures to keep slaves in line. And you start to see things becoming much more cruel, life becomes much more difficult, you know, beatings and whippings and executions of slaves who do not comply with the instructions becomes much, much more commonplace, okay? And for many English, they want to get out of the Caribbean, and so there is an alternative in the Carolinas, okay? In 1663, the uh, people like William Berkeley, the leader of Virginia and others, they start trying to colonize the Carolina region. By 1701, North Carolina becomes a separate colony, but it never becomes super prosperous. They don't have the right climate. They don't have all the right things to be a super wealthy colony, but they do get by. It becomes, North Carolina becomes more of a place for like yeoman farmers, not big plantation owners as much as, you know, just kind of like small time farmers, lumber yards, things like that. South Carolina though becomes very, very successful in the cultivation of rice, okay? Charlestown is founded. There are, at first, they try to make South Carolina kind of like a utopian society with like an enlightened constitution of like a landed nobility. They're trying to recreate Europe in South Carolina and there's serious opposition. It doesn't work. South Carolina becomes a colony in a very similar vein to the other colonies, but South Carolina uh, becomes very much driven by the slave trade. Okay, and South Carolina very quickly becomes a majority black colony and they have some of the most, you know, strict laws about slaves as a result, which leads to deeper and deeper racism and senses of looking at African Americans and seeing them as inferior, which leads to racism that even persists today. Okay, now we're going to talk about this a little bit quickly, but one thing that happens is Carolina is very close to Spanish Florida, and there is an Indian slave trade that exists as well. And a lot of people don't know about this, but 
different tribes of Indians would attack and kidnap each other and sell each other into slavery as well. So there was an Indian slave trade that already existed, but Europeans see this as an economic opportunity. They start buying Indian slaves and thousands and thousands of Indians are captured in the area that is now Georgia and Florida and South Carolina by different tribes of Native Americans and sold to the English, okay? One of the most uh, prolific Indian slave slave trading tribes is the Yamasi, okay? The English colonists start raiding into Spanish Florida to get slaves and to attack the Spanish and kind of get at them anyways. And the Yamasi are kind of like the intermediaries and they play both sides. They work for the English and they fight against each other, but they're too successful. The Yamasi basically capture just about everybody they can and sell them into slavery. And then the Yamasi realize that they're next on the block. You know, if they can't find more slaves to give to the English, then the English just might start coming for them as slaves. And so the Yamasi fight a war with the English that is successful enough to dissuade English from having Native American slaves. The English start to realize that you know, capturing the Native Americans as slaves is just causing lots of wars and battles with the Native Americans that they don't want. And it's much stabler and, and easier for many, for many English colonists to just buy slaves from Africa and use them. So the in Indian slave trade doesn't last very long, okay? Um, by, by 1703, blacks in South Carolina are the majority. By 1730, they outnumber white settlers two to one, and again, that leads to some of the changes in the laws in that area. Now, last one we're gonna talk about is Georgia, okay? Georgia is founded largely by a guy named James Oglethorpe. It's kind of envisioned as a utopian society that will create new prosperity for people and it's a place to give people a second chance, okay? Now, Georgia, is really important to the English as a buffer to the Spanish in Florida. The English want to keep the Spanish in Florida from attacking their more desirable colony of Virginia in South Carolina. And so Georgia is envisioned in 1732 as a buffer state, kind of like a place to stop the Spanish from getting there. And so the English kind of throw their riffraff into Georgia. They take, now, James Oglethorpe might think of the worthy poor, but in many ways, Georgia becomes a place for convicts, for you know people who don't have much of a chance of a wealthy life in England, and kind of the, the rough and tumble people of English society to get sent to Georgia. And the English do that a lot, okay? There is a system of prison colonies. Australia is probably the most famous, where people were given the option do you want to go to jail or do you want to go to Australia? And so they would send people there. And, and Georgia kind of becomes a place like that as well. Um, initially, Georgia tries to have a utopian society outlawing slavery and liquor and limiting the amount of land that people can have, but that doesn't last for very long. Georgia becomes a place for all sorts of people to settle. They try to attract the worthy poor of Protestants and Jews, but by the middle of the seven, 1700s, Georgia is another kind of primarily slaveholding colony full of plantations and forced labor, agricultural export uh, colony like South Carolina and Virginia and Maryland, okay? And so with that, we see the beginnings of the Southern states of the United States. And yeah, that's, uh, that's all we're gonna cover for this video. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, make sure you're doing your homework assignments in your textbook. If you're online, make sure that you are getting on the Blackboard and doing your Learn Smart assignments. And please be checking your email for updates from me, especially once we get closer to our first test. Follow your syllabus, work on your research paper, and I hope to see you all soon. All right. And with that, we're going.